first. Uh, Tegan, are you taking minutes on this one? Is that what I'm seeing? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the first order of business is to approve the minutes of January 22nd, February 4th, which was continued to February 9th, and of February 7th. Any discussion about those? Somebody would like to move those? Uh, I'd make a motion to accept. Okay. Minutes. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Is Corey on the whiteboard now? <laughs> Is this <laughs> inappropriate to sit here? <laughs> I don't. I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. I just have all my wine. <laughs> <laughs> Kari didn't vote, I assume. Okay, um, now I'll take a motion to. Uh, you've all had a chance to look at the board orders, I hope. I'll take a motion to approve and sign the board orders. An additional one that came in a tenth warrant today. It's a single invoice. Okay. <laughs> for for Sandra's. Oh, for Sandra, does this pay her up to the end? No, just no, for a, she's still to, got another for, couple of weeks. No, we just, just, I just placed, I have it here, but I just placed it. Okay. Folder. Are those ready to, to send around for us to sign? They are. Okay, can I have a motion to approve the board orders to sign? So moved. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a second? Second. Thank All you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thanks. Uh, we've had a request. Apparently, it's up to the select board to determine whether or not we can uh, uh, an employee can take a bereavement leave if it's not a, an immediate family member. That was defined by the contract. Is it appropriate for me to say who it is and why he's asking for leave in public? I was going to leave his name out of it, but okay, it's yeah. an uncle. It's a member of the road crew, and it's an uncle who he's very close to, and he's asked for a day, I presume, to go with him. Yes, uh, the day is not specified yet. Uh, he did take a half day on Friday to help his family. So I guess on his behalf, I would request that half day, a four hour day, and then a nine hour day to be determined when a funeral is scheduled. Nine hours or eight hours? It's a nine hour day, it's the typical. If it falls, well, whatever, whatever day it falls on the schedule. Oh, okay. Uh, and Make a motion to uh, approve the bereavement relative to Harry's description. Second. All second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I think in the future we should look at the personnel policy. It doesn't seem to me this is a select board issue. We well, we can, it's in the I think it's in the contract. Uh, the oh, in the contract. Oh, yeah. So, um, okay. and at the time, I believe that was. Close to the language that we had in the policy and the personnel policy at the time, so I know there's been some discussion about that as we've been trying to reconcile them. So, you know, I think any changes that we make in the personnel policy would then, in due course, be represented in the in the union contract. So. <clears throat> um, okay, the order for the Western Star Truck. Uh, any questions about that? That was all in your board packet. This is to replace the 2019 truck. And 2017. 2017 and the 2019 truck will then become the spare. The, the 20, so. so the green bean is the one that we'd be replacing in this truck? I don't, I don't know that. We have an, a spare truck. It's a 2014. We will be trading that one in, receiving a credit of 50000 yeah. Then the 2017 will become the new spare. This truck, uh, if we were now, will be available uh, a year from now. And you all approve the ordering of it on October 9th. So this is just to confirm now that we have a price. And then um, once we get closer, we can talk about the financing. Uh, we will certainly have the option to pay interest only uh, in the spring of 2025, which is important for the like, capital highway equipment. Right. right. Okay. Everybody understand the issue? Any questions? We've all looked it over. You all know what we're talking about. So I'll we'll take a motion to approve, we authorize this order. Okay. I'll second. Uh, nobody moved it yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> And I think Ann just seconded. Sure, 
I'll second it. Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Curtis Pond Dam resolution. All right. We made the very difficult um, decision on Friday to move forward with the um, bond. We're to ask them to issue the bond. The closing will be tomorrow, I believe. Is that so? Oh, no, no. The um, closing will be March. Oh, March. <laughs> oh, for some reason I thought. Yeah, it won't be for a little while. All right. So, well, why don't you tell them? Uh, yeah, so this is a, um, a whole packet of materials that Thomas Maloney, who's with us, um, uh, put together for us. The resolution is the key document. If you adopt this resolution, then that encompasses all the other actions, the loan agreement, issuing of the bond, the tax compliance. So I think we need um, four, four different pages need signatures from you. Um, yeah, so the, the closing is scheduled for March 13th. Um, and, um, and then we still don't know interest rates once the, those, will get, those will be established, I think, next week. So while we have Thomas here, and you have, you've all, I assume, had a chance to look at this resolution, are there any questions? Uh, I have one. Thomas, are you there? Yes, hi. I see yes, you yes, I am. Hi, good evening. Thanks. Um, in uh, 1.4 of the whereas is, it says that interest on the bond it, it can't be included in gross income for federal income tax purposes. We are going to be putting it into a money market, or I guess it's the bond bank that puts it in the money market. So that's not our that's income, is that right? That, that's, that's an exception for, you know, te temporary, there's a temporary period of which when you're not using your bond proceeds to actually pay for mm -hmm. capital costs. It can be invested um, and, and you're allowed to earn uh, interest on, on it uh, with um, to, to cover your, your carrying costs. So it's the, the bond itself, the interest on the, on the bond that, that the town that will be issuing to the bond bank to evidence and secure the repayment of the loan that the bond bank will make will be making to the town for the project. Um, that is, the interest on that is uh, excluded from gross income. So that's that's really what the whereas clause is, is, is getting to. So. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Thomas? So I'll take a motion to approve and do we all have to sign? Mm -hmm. Adopt the resolution. Uh, to adopt and it looks like we all have to sign and sign the resolution as written. Uh, so moved. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. And seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 You. Aye. Oh, Jamie's abstaining, yes. <laughs> All right, we'll get um, signatures after, or if you want to start. I, I put stickies on the pages of these. Does that mean I Wait. should not sign? Yeah. That's a question for Thomas. So we, Thomas, we have one board member who's abstaining, but should they still sign attesting that the board? I think uh, I understand the reason for the abstention. Um, the the requirements of Vermont law is, uh, you know, a, a, the bond itself needs to be signed by the select board, uh, and and it doesn't indicate how the person voted, but it is, you know, it has now been approved by the select board by you know, majority vote of all right. those present uh, at, at, for which a quorum was, was uh, met at a public meeting. So it, it should be signed by all select board members. So as, as well as the treasurer, the town treasurer will need to sign as, uh, as, as well. So. Oh, the second uh, signature cheese. <laughs> Don't take the fifth one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Moving right. Oh, thank you, Thomas. All right. I'll you. I'll drop off. Good. Thank thank you all. We'll we'll be in thank touch. You. Uh, yeah, you're right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right. Um, and you all know that we that the last select board um, obligated sixty thousand uh, dollars in ARPA funds to the East Calais Fire District. 
Uh, what we need to do tonight is actually um, move to transfer it to them. Um, there's some danger that if we don't do that soon, the feds may take it back. But once we've actually transferred it to the um, recipient, then they will not. So, does everybody understand what we'd be doing? So, therefore, okay, I will take a motion to transfer, is that the right language? Transfer $60,000 in ARPA funds to the East Calais Fire District. So moved. Hands moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Donnie seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thanks. Now we have the bond grader resolution. Um, the grader bond resolution. This was previously adopted back in January 22nd. This, we didn't get signatures, so for the records we'd like to. Did you fix the date? Because it said adopted January 22nd. Well, that's the date you did adopt it. Oh, okay. Verbally. We're just, we're just getting um, a document for that. Oh, so we've done it. We don't even need to vote. Correct. Thank you. Okay. So let me sign that as it comes around. Um, Barbara, can you speak to this one? We designate the swim committee appointees from one to two years. Yes. Um, in the past, our swim committee appointees were a one-year term. I'm not quite sure why it was that set, set up that way, and the swim committee members are not quite sure. So I'm asking the select board if you would like to move that to a two-year term so we're not needing to appoint them every single year. The two current members of the swim committee have agreed to this if the select board will approve it. So the motion would be then to um, may designate swim committee terms for two years and to appoint each of the current members to two year terms. Um, that may be two different motions. Yeah, I think it is because we're not both going to be not in the same way. Right. Okay. I'm going to do it too. Uh, well, um, any discussion on this? Okay, I'll take a motion to redesignate the school committee appointees for one to two year terms. So moved. Donnie moved. Do we have a second? Second. Jordan seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, now we need to appoint. We have two members currently on the committee. Hopefully we'll have a third after town meeting. We would appoint Daniel Keeney to a two-year term ending in 2026 and Adrian Wade Keeney to a one-year term ending in March 2025. Would somebody like to move that? So moved. Okay. All second. Jordan moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Does any there's Anybody in the public want to, um, now's, the, now's your time. Barbara. <laughs> I always have something. Um, um, for the purpose of the minutes, could we ask Elizabeth on Zoom to identify her last name? Elizabeth, are you there? We just need your last name for the minutes. Oh, hi. It's Alan, A-L-L-E-N. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Scott. Um, I sort of brought this on myself by not attending meetings in the last several years. As you were doing that great budget process you were working on, um, I was in a meeting on uh, Sunday of the Friends of the Callis Town Hall. And Nick happened to walk in on the meeting. He's not a member of that group, but he had been meeting down here. And I think he told me that the decision to move the generator had been put off a year. Is, uh, can somebody give me some background on this? I don't remember. Does anybody remember this? Barbara, yeah, do you remember? So I think he just meant a calendar year. It didn't happen in 2023, so it's going to happen in spring or early summer of 2024. I think that's what he meant. I don't think he meant it's going to happen a year from now. But I think he meant, since it didn't happen in 2023, it's happening in 2024. That, 
does sound right. Do any of the rest of you remember this? I don't remember us discussing it, but they told us that that's what it would have to do. Well, it got so far into the fall that yeah. it was just too difficult to do it with the weather and the snow and ice. So we're looking to do it in early, late spring, early summer. Um, unless Nick now knows something else that the rest of us don't know. Right. No, I don't think so. Good. Okay. That's <clears throat> good with that, and let's just keep it on the top. A, a, a job like this delayed is a job that never happens. So okay. we need Thank to you. keep Thanks, it in Scott. mind. Thank, Thank you, Scott. Thank you all. Okay. Anybody else? No. All right. Thank you. All right. We have here two people from the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, Sam Lash. And Sam has brought, Sam, you are a senior planner. With nope, this. I'm a climate and energy planner. You're <laughs> Doesn't that make you a planner? Yes, planner, but not a senior planner. Not quite, not quite. But Brian. <laughs> and you brought Brian with you. Why don't uh, you introduce Brian to us? And you're going to, I think you've got yeah. several yeah. folks. Yeah. I do have a spot. John, when did you get here? <laughs> I don't know if I should just send a link or uh, how to do that. Just. Do you want me to send you a link? Okay, okay, perfect. Great. Brian, would you mind introducing yourself yeah, while I do that? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you talk about what I want to talk about while you're getting set up. Perfect. So uh, I'm, I'm Brian Boyd. I'm a, a senior planner focused on natural resources. I've um, been with CVRPC almost two years now. And I work really heavily in the water quality realm. And so I'm the, leading the Clean Water Service Provider Program for the Winooski River Basin. So um, for, as part of that program, we get about a million dollars per year to invest in non-regulatory phosphorus reduction projects throughout the Winooski River Basin. So um, that's, that's one big component of, of my job. And then the other piece that I want to talk about um, tonight as well is that um, when I, way back when I first started, uh, there was an opportunity to apply for some funding for implementing stormwater projects. And two of those projects are in Calais. One's the um, Moscow, golly, I should know this better, the, the Calis Post, East Calais Post Office and the Moscow Woods uh, Gully. And so, we were successful in our proposal, so I now have money to fund the implementation of those two projects. And want to- Sorry, you mentioned one. Oh, yeah, the, um, the East Calais Post Office and the Moscow Woods uh, Oh, so that's two. Two different projects, but I believe they're really close to the two. But the East Calais yeah. Post Office, is that the filtration thing that was supposed yeah, to be black hole? Yeah. I kept asking what that was, and no one could know. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Yay. Yeah. So, um, so we have we have funds at CVRPC to support the implementation, but also to pay for staff time to help uh, manage the, the project and basically be the the go between the engineer and construction contractor and the, the town. So at this point, I have uh, a draft request for proposals that I would like to to share with you, or maybe there's a person on the select board that would like to be the, the point person for these projects. My goal would be to keep your involvement to as, as little as you want or as much as you want, but again, I have funding to support my staff time to essentially manage the, the projects. So um, that's, the, that's the, the good news. Two projects, we have money, and uh, if the, the town is still interested, we can move forward. Um, get an engineer in to confirm the, the design still works for the site, hire a construction team, and uh, get those projects implemented this summer. I would say our point person would be the town administrator who is also our road commissioner. Okay, okay. <laughs> Great. And then, you know, moving beyond that, uh, I'm not sure if any of you were involved in the, the stormwater master plan work that uh, was done here in Calais. I believe that was from 2019, so going on five years ago. Um, that process is what led to the, the two projects that we have funding for being identified. Um, there were several other projects that were identified as, as priorities, including one at the elementary school and one at the, the town garage. 
And um, you know, moving forward, if the, the town is interested, we can certainly keep our eye out for additional monies that would uh, make it possible to, to implement those projects as well. The nice thing about this current pot of money that I have for the, the two projects that I, I just mentioned is that there's not a local match. Um, I can't promise that it's always going to be that good. Um, we can certainly we can certainly try. We can certainly look around for money that's a, a little bit less restricted, but um, a lot of competition in that space. But uh, if if the town is interested in continuing to pursue stormwater mitigation work, then we're happy to, to partner with you and, and identify funding opportunities that we could uh, jointly pursue. Questions? On that? So when you say stormwater mitigation, could you say a little more about what, just help us understand what kinds of projects are you talking about redirecting water? Um, yeah, so the, the two that are being, um, that will be built uh, this summer with the, with the money involve um, catch basins, underground catch basins. There might be a, a sand filter for one. I have to look at the, the design again. I just finished a, a similar project in Moortown at their elementary school and town office complex where we installed three different sand filters and then um, multiple catch basins to essentially capture the water and direct it in a way that it's not just flowing uh, into a stream untreated. Um, which was the case there. All, all the runoff from the parking lot and around the school was going directly into what's known as Doctors Brook, and Doctors Brook, about 100 yards later, then flows directly into the Lunguski. So it's essentially, we're trying to manage the water to slow it down, to spread it out, and make sure we can, to the extent possible, capture the nutrients before they just get flushed right down into the, the river and eventually go into the lake. So it's not one specific practice, there's a, a range of potential practices that could be implemented depending on what's called for at a, a specific site. And so for the two, that sounds like there's approval for it and, and full funding, those, those are estimates that are still pretty pretty accurate, you know, even though there aren't, aren't any matching requirements with this funding, would any like project overage be uh, be covered or uh, where would the town potentially have to be? Yeah, so um, I don't have a, a definitive answer on, on that, but what, what would ideally be our course of action is to um, get the request for proposals out, identify an engineering firm to come take a, another look at the projects, do any last touch up on the, the final design. It's interesting because it's the final design is done, but then there's still work to do for the sure. final design, which is a little bit confusing. Um, and at that point, they'll confirm the, the cost. And from there, if the if the revised cost estimate exceeds what we have, I would go back to the funder and ask if they had additional money as my first course of action. Um, these are two priority projects that were identified, as I mentioned, in the stormwater master plan. So the funder receives a big chunk of money they issue a call for proposals for all different you know, projects throughout the state. Some of those projects um, get approved, but then they never happen. You know, there's a change of heart on the, uh, from the landowner, for example. So it's possible there would be extra money available, and I would certainly go after that. And if there is not, and there is a cost difference, then at that point, you know, we come back have a conversation about whether or not it's still a priority, given that now there would be a town contribution required, and if um, you all see fit to, to proceed, then, then we would, and if not, then at that point, unfortunately, we'd, we'd have to pull the plug on the project. So, maybe just getting into the weeds a little bit, but like, um, uh, I'm wondering if there's like a kind of a second tier of, of funders there, like the Given the given the area, like the Friends of the New or something like that, that would be approached um, or in the past, like whether or not there's kind of a second tier of funders like that who are highly motivated to to put resources that would kind of be considered and vetted before before coming back to the town to try to make up the the difference, or if there's a history of that. Yeah, I'm I'm certainly open to working with any partners. Friends of Lunuski, at least my understanding of the organization, it's not they don't have money that they could just say, oh, sure. oh yeah. you need 20000 let me just cut you a check real, real quick. Um, but they have a lot of other connections as well, and, and we work with Friends of Lunuski on the Clean Water Service Provider uh, Program. 
And I don't see any problem with looking for funding from a different source. Um, again, there's no match requirement right, sure. here, which makes a lot of things a lot easier. Um, so if we need to pursue a co-funded model, I'd be happy to, to help work that out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody who's um, participating by Zoom, any questions there? Let's see, we can't see them, Cardi. How would we know? Yeah, Jim. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Um, is this all part of the, of the um, I, I'm cleaning out stuff from my office. <laughs> and I ran, in, I'm, I ran into the 2017 Palace Road Erosion Inventory Segment Score Summary for 2017 that Pam DeAndrea did. And a lot of the stuff you're talking about at the school and the other ones, I mean, Moscow Woods and the post office, we're all part of this. Is, is this the background information for what you're talking about tonight? Um, yes and no. The, the work that you're referencing happened prior to the stormwater master planning effort. So, I mean, they're directly related. There's certainly a lot of overlap, but the, through the stormwater master planning effort, they <laughs> Uh, advanced the design of five of the projects to the 30% level, what, what's known as preliminary design. Um, and the, the stormwater mapping is more like an inventory of what is there and what infrastructure currently exists and um, more sort of back of the envelope ideas about what could be done. So the, um, that stormwater mapping comes out of uh, DEC as well. So again, there's definite overlap between the, the work you're, you're referencing, the stormwater master plan, and then eventually the, the funding opportunity that we pursued to get the money to, to do the implementation for these projects. They all sort of build off of one another. Well, I, it's a pretty sad state of affairs if you want me to, okay, you throw <laughs> stuff out from your office, but yes, um, yes you can because uh, that report is available online. Jen, don't you have like a box that you can just bring to the town office instead of a wrap or something? Well, you know, I don't know. I have this huge bag of planning commission stuff, and I don't think you want it. <laughs> well, that's why I was wondering if you And then I'll, I'll turn it over to Sam. I just wanted to say one other other thing about the, the Clean Water Service Provider Program that I, I mentioned at the, the top here. Um, one of our colleagues that works with me on water resources um, has been sort of working his way through uh, a really boring DEC database to look for other potential projects, and particularly projects that will have a significant phosphorus reduction component to them, and we anticipate uh, reaching out to the Planning Commission in the next two months probably to, to set up a time, Planning and Conservation Commissions, uh, to set up a time to talk about project ideas, um, find out if there's any new uh, ideas out there in terms of projects that uh, we could find a local champion for, and then try to um, match those projects up with funding through the, the Clean Water Service Provider. So more, more on that to come as well. When you say phosphorus runoff, I think of farmers. Is there other sources of phosphorus runoff that we would be thinking about? Yeah, any, I mean, any time you're seeing erosion along the roadside, any of the, the runoff that's coming across the landscape, it's picking up nutrients uh, as it's moving across the landscape. So it's not just phosphorus from agricultural runoff, although that's certainly a, a component. It could be a, a failing septic system. It could be... Um, any number of, of things, including even uh, lawns for people that put down fertilizer. Most people that fertilize their lawns put way more fertilizer down than what's needed. All that would um, get captured in overland flow. And what we're trying to do is make sure that that water doesn't um, go all the way through the, the system without trying to, to mitigate the phosphorus loading. So I think to address that, Brian, um, the Planning Commission in their regulations that are going to be voted on in March. We have a new erosion control, which is asking um, for that, 
for people even under one acre of, of disruption to follow what is one acre, uh, acre of disruption. Because the reality in Callis is we have so many roads that are so close to the lakes, everything mm -hmm. is running off into the lakes. And I think one of the problems that we understand is that some of those roads are not really correctly made to uh, mitigate going in the water going into the lakes. And so I, you know, whatever's going to happen with that, I don't really know. But I mean, the, the problem is recognized. Great. Well, I look forward to, to furthering the conversation then. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm Sam Lash, for those that I have met, which is a lot of you. Uh, she Harris, I'm the Climate and Energy Planner at Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Um, thanks, John, for the invite. <laughs> and, and thank you so much, Anne, for, for your conversations. Um, so maybe I'll just start with a little bit of like how this came about. Um, so there is a grant called the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant um, Program. It's a federal program. Um, Vermont already got $3 million to do some planning, so a lot of states had formula funds, so that was like, if you apply, you're eligible, this will be your chunk, right? Um, that makes us eligible then to apply for the other phase. You'll see a pattern here with programs I might mention. <laughs> that makes you eligible then for implementation funds. Now these are extremely competitive, but there are $4.6 billion of funding for the implementation of things that reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. Now, the reason I'm here is basically to say, what does that mean? <laughs> what is climate planning? What does that look like? Are we doing it? Are we not doing it? So I have a few slides on that. Uh, pardon if it's a total you know, recap. Uh, we can whiz through it. We can ask questions and uh, whatnot. I am going to be skipping the service today because you know, after some conversations um, with folks in the room, you know, there's a lot of topics that you're interested in covering. And there's a lot going on here. And it's awesome to also see like, a room full of folks leadership and governance, so um, I'm, I'm pretty excited. But just to say, I am very much skimming the surface. Any one of these we could spend this entire time on. <laughs> um, I have included a lot of links, and I will continue to add them throughout, and then I'll share, reshare this with you all. Um, I'm actually, honestly, this will probably just go live on the website, and I'll just try to keep it updated. Um, I've done one of the things that I will suggest that you don't do and try to compile all the funding that's available because it is a full-time job and it changes constantly and the rules change constantly. Um, but I gave my best go otherwise. <laughs> um, so I'll, you know, throughout this I just have, oh, I'm not controlling that. My next slide? Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Great, so this is a whirlwind tour, as I said. This is really a reference. Um, definitely don't need to, like, we can definitely still have a conversation about it. Um, I, I have a lot of recommendations and tips and tricks and FAQs. Now, nothing in here is you were required to do. Nothing I am saying you have to do or even should do. These are just ideas of things that count. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want anyone up an arm saying, CVRPC said we should do. No, that is not. This is a brainstorm um, document. Uh, is full of resources um, and references and, and all sorts of things. Um, I absolutely welcome participation and productive interruptions, all right? Um, so as long as it's productive, yeah, I, I welcome that. I do speak quickly, so also feel free to ask me to slow down. I know that about myself. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is, uh, what is climate planning? Um, so, uh, you know, really simply, as it says there, um, it's focusing both on reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, and increasing community resilience to the impacts of climate change. Uh, that, that's super broad. Um, you know, when we think about how we've seen this in our towns already, I think we really want to consider sort of two aspects of, of climate planning, and that's that we're, uh, we need to plan for big, acute, oh, I'm still Sorry. No, no worries. Um, we need to, you know, sort of be increasingly thinking about big, uh, acute, episodic events. So those are the headline events, like the one that we had this summer. Um, uh, these exacerbate hazards that already uh, exist, and, and equities as well. Um, we're seeing more uh, severe and more extreme um, disaster events like that, right? Then there also is this other aspect of climate planning, which is the new normal, right? So our baselines are shifting. So our timing of fall and spring has changed a lot. Winter is shrinking. Right? Uh, yeah, I don't think I need to say anything more about that. 
Um, but this has implications, obviously, for changing habitat ranges and crop zones, shifting zones for you know disease vectors, a whole whole big slew of things. We're also seeing our equipment running out, uh, or sort of being used up, or sort of beaten uh, a lot more, right? So it might change our replacement schedules, right? So there's just a whole variety of ways. What I'm here to do today is really just help you shift and think about framing these things as climate mitigation. Um, I think a big reason to do this is because over the next eight years or so, we're seeing like a ton of federal funding focus on um, mitigation and planning uh, federal from, from the federal government. So just a few examples are up here. You know, I told you already, we already have the three million for climate planning. That's gonna redo our climate action plan. Um, and that also is um, gonna support uh, some of uh, municipal planning as well. Um, and is that three million for the region? The whole state. Oh, the whole state. The whole state. So we're yeah. So we're just doing right now a lot, like doing a lot of reconnaissance work in all of your town plans <laughs> uh, for A and R and um, the climate office uh, with the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, they're the ones doing the application. We'll support them, um, and you will see outreach from me going forward around that as well. Um, but you know, for example, I'll talk a little bit later. You know, we're getting over twenty one and a half plus another fifty eight million for. A variety of programs, a lot of it geared towards residents, um, and those are going to come out in state programs that are being developed by agencies that we, you know, we work with, and we'll, you know, obviously want to contribute um, the perspective of what do our municipalities need, what do they need, <laughs> um, and so part of this is just to help you frame um, or think about, or, or even just collect if you're already there, uh, the types of projects that you're interested in doing. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so the good news, <laughs> we're already definitely doing this. <laughs> You're already definitely doing this. You might not say greenhouse gas reduction, emissions reductions, but you are already doing, oh, I'm sorry, this is quite small. Um, but uh, you're already doing a ton of these different things. Um, and I think the, the big thing here is to think about, um, there are obvious things that reduce, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emissions like, um, you know, switching to EVs where, where appropriate or where you can, or lower, lower diesel emissions vehicles, right? So that's like directly related to emissions. That could be reducing vehicle miles traveled through smart growth, like walking, you know, in increasing your walkability or something like that, right? Um, and then there's ones like, uh, you know, what of conservation or where we can start to look at, you know, carbon sequestration is, is really playing a, a, a very gray area right now in this, but has thus far been included in the way that the federal government is talking about this. Um, but you know, it can be a, a really wide variety of things. And I think that the key thing to remember is whenever you're doing anything, as much as you can, just pause if you don't mind and think, are there any emissions reduction benefits to the action I'm thinking about? <laughs> that would be my goal if I get anything out of this evening, would be the goal is just to add that lens, just like we do with economics, right? Just to add the lens of like, uh, is there a way that I can argue that this is um, re reducing our emissions in any way? That could be an action that has to do with like public health, it could be climate justice, it could be transportation, it could be um, yeah, something to do with land use. There's a wide variety of things and we'll go through quite a few of them this evening, but um, that's the, you know, we could you know, basically be done there if that was, that was the key takeaway. <laughs> All right, next one please. Thank you. So you have a lot of existing planning processes. <laughs> Um, as a town, I don't need to tell you this, you already know. Um, I really just show this because um, I kind of been having a mantra lately of like, let's dig once, phase up, and maximize co-benefits. So when we're doing something like, you know, you're all, you're all preparing uh, to enter your next town plan, planning, you know, update. Um, and so really taking the time to, okay, if we're gonna do, if we're, you know, these are our high priority projects, what, what do we not wanna, you don't have to come back and redo in five to 10 years, right? That, that dig once. Like if we're gonna open the walls, do we need to do something else? If we're gonna get a new roof, maybe now's the time to think about solar. Or if we're gonna have to do something electrical, maybe now's the time to upgrade the electrical panel, right? So you don't have to do the whole big project now, but are there things that we could do while we're in there that's gonna make it easier, right? And I think everyone's really used to thinking about this in terms of transportation, right? Like if you're gonna match it the right of way, what are all the things we gotta get done, right? So pretty straightforward. Um, but in all of these planning processes, um, you can think about how you prioritize projects. Um, and I think thinking, you know, in the short term with how we have this much, you know, federal funding and investment, how do we maximize, optimize <laughs> that drawdown um, in the short term, in the nearer term, to then get some of our projects done that we really need to. 
Um, and so again, I'm just going to sort of belabor the point of while you're doing each of these things, your annual budget, your replacement schedules, your maybe, you know, it's literally your boiler fails. <laughs> what can we do, take a slightly longer pause and say, you know, can we draw, is there any funding available? Can we draw it down? Might there be some, you know, very soon on the horizon? Let's just quick call Sam real fast. <laughs> or someone else. All right. Doesn't have to be me. Go ahead. As we're uh, being good stewards and uh, coming up with those questions during yeah. those planning, are we reaching out to you about how to find those funds or incentives or et cetera to offset some of those investments? So yeah, actually, if you wouldn't mind going back one slide. Sure. Um, so one of the things is you can absolutely reach out to me. I will say um, I'm, I will be totally upfront. I'm a little spread thin at the moment. That does not mean I that love, I love, <laughs> I love direct questions. Anything where I can immediately say yes, no, here's a website. I'm usually on it fast. But um, yeah, and I actually have, I will just tell you this all now. Um, in my email signature, I'm not in, when I'm not in um, the office, there's a little link. You can sign up for a 15 minute phone, like a video call or phone call with me. That's the best way. But yes, absolutely. Um, uh, but I also do suggest here, you do have an energy coordinator, Bill Powell, he's great. Um, an energy committee, however, could be more focused on either municipal operations, although you have Scott, who's been phenomenal with the Municipal Energy Resilience Grant Program on your behalf. So an energy committee you might want to consider, um, could be focused on, hey, do we want to help our residents draw down some of this funding? Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But So I, you know, energy committees function differently across our region and across the state. We have over 13 out of 23, so we're over halfway. Um, and then we have various champions and other talents as well. Um, they do tend to either focus very specifically on the municipality itself or on resident programs. Um, and so they're a great resource because they, they really already exist. And I also included a lot here. Um, but yeah, I am totally fine to be a default as well. Uh, that's a great question. And I have a question that's like three steps back, uh, but I think a, an easy one for you. Um, the three million dollars uh, mm -hmm. that is kind of like your mark for the planning process is that, uh, and does that in part include funding for like formal planning, like funding formal planning processes for the towns? So if the towns want to, I mean, in any of the rural communities, you're going to have expertise that's limited, right? And so, and and volunteers that are also spread thin, um, and so one of the Many challenges, I, I guess, is is getting resources that are informed and professional, and plugging them into those long-term planning processes, like the one that we're facing next year. Um, it, it sounds like maybe there's some funding for pulling those professional resources into that process. Is that accurate? Yeah. So um, we don't have the final contract yet, so I can't. <laughs> I won't. I won't. Say guaranteed, but the idea when this originally, when they, when Vermont put together um, their plan for the three million, did include some funds to support municipal enhanced energy planning. So it's a specific plan. You are not obligated to do that. I do have a bunch of slides on that later on. Okay. Um, but uh, I do suggest throughout that there are various, uh, there are plenty of other folks, um, and I do have a whole list of like who are the first people to go to, um, and you can obviously use whomever you want, but you know, if you want to do visioning and project prioritization, VCRD is great, Vermont Council on Rural Development. If you want to, here's my project, I want 15 minutes on a super detailed funding, like tell me where to start with funding, you know, Sam gave me some, but I want something else, and or I have a very specific funding question, you know, here are the 15 minute work, you know, uh, appointments you can make with Vermont leagues and cities and towns. So like, it really depends, but I have also pointed out in the federal programs, they are much more so in this sphere, providing technical assistance to communities that need it through the whole process. Now I will say, at that federal level, the admin burden is extremely high. So they will hold your hand, but someone still has to be there. Um, and so I think the thing is, is, is it can be worth that process, or and even worth you know maybe hiring a grant writer or a manager or a project manager for something they can easily pay for themselves by getting one of those funding opportunities, right? And you know, you can learn enough about it through the technical assistance that it, they provide. This goes for um, USDA, this goes for the EPA, um, this goes for quite a few of the Department of Energy funds, and I will, I, I will always say technical assistance mm -hmm. and, and technical assistance where it's there. 
So a lot of the community grants are like that. And um, you know, one of the suggestions that I have is understand your baseline. Like, what do you, what are, you, what does the federal government think you are? <laughs> Rural is one of them. Um, and then we have other indices that I'm happy to help you explore that might point out to um, that you can point out to them. Say we should be eligible for this extra technical assistance. Absolutely. Um, a big part of this energy work and sort of resilience and climate work has been this equity and justice piece. And so I think that's why we're seeing more of that in this sphere. Uh, I will, however, say that they still are designing them absolutely for municipalities that have like 15 departments, right? That's just like their perspective. That does not mean that I want to discourage you whatsoever. Um, and you know, we are, we can to support support to a certain degree also some of that work. No, I guess that you know some of the context behind my little probing yeah. questions there is yeah. that like <clears throat> even even in how this information is being presented, you look at like some of the projects and and. Uh, thought starters that you have in there for the ideation process, but like those are largely driven by like high impact projects or priorities mm -hmm. relative to, uh, to to denser populated areas and that sort of thing. And, and I think the challenges for a, a rural community are, are twofold, and Vermont is a whole state full of them, right? And so <laughs> even the cities are probably pretty rural by most standards. Yeah. Um, and and so you know you. I think sometimes see things um, that um, are are good idea starters, um, but then when it comes to generating the ideas or the implementation at the rural level, the priorities are sometimes misaligned, mm -hmm. um, and it really helps to um, have somebody who comes in and has you know data driven information yeah. on like this is what is going to impact your particular, uh, your particular type of community and, and the types of projects to look out for. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you get it right on a rural scale, like that is then applicable to the entire state. Um, yeah. as, well, not anymore. Well, not, not anymore. anymore. But, yeah, but. Sure. Um, <laughs> I anyway, myself recently. that's, that's yeah. my soapbox, yeah. I guess. Absolutely. I will say, though, that there are, particularly in energy infrastructure, there are many programs that are specifically only for rural communities sure. to address rural infrastructure gaps specifically. They just still have a high admin burden. But I will say, happy to point in the direction of those projects that are much more geared towards that. And I will also say that you know we've been doing a fair amount of work at, at, the, at the RPC, working with, uh, with different agencies of the state and with other RPCs across the region, um, uh, across the state, excuse me, um, to uh, identify project types that are useful for our towns so that the state is applying specifically for the types of programs that you want to see they're going to develop the programs and then expend the funds, at least through this, if they get the implementation funds for this. And the other case is if you want to apply on your own to some of these programs. And so I think that's an important thing to also keep in mind is that there are a lot of these have state funds and then they have municipalities are also eligible to apply. So there's a very big difference between, you know, just you know, making sure every once in a while you read CBRPC newsletter and you, and you read an email from me every once in a while. And when I say, hey, the state's doing the program, you know, finally in two years that, that we, I talked about tonight, um, you know, let's have a chat and see if you want to participate, right? Great. There are also some things that, you know, like on-site generation and storage that you might want to consider for a municipal building, that you might want to support a community embedded place to do. I mean, I think some of these ideas that are developed in urban settings, we can adapt for our rural settings quite well, and they're actually more important here because we don't have that, like when you think about it, there's not that many places you can go sometimes um, when there are severe outages to actually get what you need to, for, especially for medically de you know, electrically dependent residents or the like. So. I guess if I can like kind of recharacterize what I was kind of getting at is, sure. um, it, and I think you're, I think you're, I agree with you, um, but um, I think sometimes what ends up happening at, at like the kind of the state kind of the, the macro level is that you have the identification of the types of projects and you say, okay, there's going to be funding for all of this and then it gets bumped down for the planning down at the community level and then there's like a misalignment over priorities yeah. um, because there might be a misunderstanding on what kinds of things actually have a, a good, uh, a, like a, a good impact. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, stormwater I think is a, is a good one. It's easy to just kind of overlook it, but like there's some pretty measurable uh, benefits uh, to making sure that that's worked into and then how do you work into it. And so I, anyway. I'm extremely passionate. Passionate about Stormwater, so I'm pumped to hear you say that. Yeah, John, go ahead. So, so Sam, you and I spoke just briefly yeah. setting this up about um, what might be eligible, and, yeah. and I'd asked about 
carbon sequestration. I don't know if you're going to go into that a little bit. in greater depth. Yeah. Um, but and I won't try to preempt you. But the, my other qu the other question that comes to my mind is, Callus has uh, been working to mitigate invasives. Mm -hmm. and they're, they're investing in a new hundred thirty thousand dollar tractor to do manage the roadsides on a more frequent basis because mm -hmm. we have you know, invasives problem, gerbil and some other things. Um, Hogweed, I guess. Um, but is it, are any of those things grant eligible as far as you know at this moment? It really, it really depends. For any existing programs of right this second, no. But we know that specifically in this space, the state is going to develop or expand some of the existing programs. So the key thing is to let me know now <laughs> that that's what you're interested in. So every time they ask me to a stakeholder meeting to say, what are your titles about? I, I say that immediately, very clearly, very succinctly. Uh, and, that's, and that's also advocacy that you're, you know, should, I, we will welcome you to do when I'm sure we'll pull you all together um, and look over either some lists or, or, or whatnot, or propose our own um, projects as well. So um, not currently, but also a lot of it is about framing. Yeah. So like, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Brian. And you might also have another source. Yeah, the, um, well, the Waitsfield Warren and Basin Conservation Commissions mm -hmm. just got some funding to support uh, Japanese knotweed management yeah. effort. Um, I don't remember the funding source off the top of my head, but uh, <laughs> yes, I will, I will look that up and I can circle back with you on that. John um, awesome. and Kurt Lindbergh, who I don't know if you know him or maybe you weren't at the Clean Water Advisory Committee meeting where he talked a little bit more about that program, but he's a he's a great resource, so I can I'll check okay. in with him and yep. um, also um, be able to connect you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with yeah. him, he's sort of him and a couple other folks have been really spearheading that uh, effort down in the. In the okay. Yeah, I think that the thing is that some of it might fall under straight resilience, but always bring it up in the same breath, right? <laughs> um, because and also if we can think about you know maybe it's a you know, um, if there's a, ro a vehicle replacement component to it and it has a higher efficiency, like there is, a, it is possible yeah, that we could do that through the diesel. Way more efficient. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. maybe. Never know. But I mean, but that's the thing. Is like really, yeah. let's get, you know, let's think through that. Um, you know, I have some on here about the different programs, but for me, even having to do vehicles, but we have several programs like that in the state that operate basically on you give them a call. <laughs> so, you know, my thing is is make make a instead of you know one sentence. We want, we're doing this, you know, do this, and the added benefits are X, Y, and Z, right? If we don't have not in our culverts, then, you know, things won't flood as much, there won't be as much erosion on the roads, we don't have to use as much material in the roads to keep the, you know, I mean, the, I, less vehicle miles traveled for the road crew, I mean, not, we can, we can make yeah, that if we yeah, want yeah, to. Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's a, within reason. I mean, it's as long as it's genuinely for, you know, it's kind of thing the community, then I, I'd say, let's always worth a try. <laughs> All right, uh, next slide, yeah. please, thank you. And I'm gonna go through, yeah, we might have to, um, you know, we'll see some, okay, so here, land use, yeah. So some on the left are for more developed areas, right? So promoting the development of compact, walkable, mixed-use neighborhoods. Um, that sort of smart growth vibe is gonna be for sort of your, you know, population centers. But then on the same breath on the right, I have those carbon sequestration, conservation, sort of resilience programs as well. This is by no means um, by no means uh, comprehensive, right? So these are just some ideas. You guys are well familiar with your village centers with the growth center designation programs by the state. Um, that makes you eligible for a whole host of, uh, you know, uh, tax incentives and, and a whole host of uh, uh, projects and programs like Better Places. Um, you know, there are small grants for smart growth. I, I don't need to list them here. You can look at them at your leisure and go through them as you want. But my point by showing you this is, is that there are a ton. And so pairing something like placemaking with something else that might have some greenhouse gas emissions reductions might help you get that project done combining the sources of funding. So what we're talking about here is really just getting used to the idea of funding stacking. I'm pretty sure you're all very familiar with the BRIC program, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities programs. Um, the wetland programs are coming soon. Um, there's a whole list of them there at A&R, but none of them are specifically about um, uh, carbon sequestration. And I'm very curious to see what um, the climate office has in mind for how they're gonna frame our existing programs in that sense, or if they're gonna add them. So that is yet to happen. 
And all I've done is made sure whenever we meet with them is to say, you know, we're really interested in that. What, any idea where you're going? Here's where, you know, what some of, would be useful for some of our towns, right? Uh, and here's a whole host of, you know, <laughs> of mitigating, uh, you know, disasters, basically, and benefits uh, that that would give them, right? Um, you know, so there's a current use program, and we are surely likely going to see some some movement in either uh, in, in that program or in something that would complement it. Um, uh, there's urban and community forest programs. There, you know, obviously the flood is like communities funds. Um, so here, what I, you know, what I'm asking is, when you're already looking at these other funds for other projects, just think to yourself: Are there co-benefits to these things we need to get done that are greenhouse gas emissions? Oh. Let me just write that down because you know we could pool those together. Um, I have also uh, here there's uh, at the bottom, um, Chittenden County uh, did a climate change and land use um, sort of guide. It's just a whole bunch of sort of ideas um, and uh, things you could do. Everything from your you know your town plan and your land use regulations. You know if you want to eliminate minimum lot sizes or remove maximum residential density standards. Not things that you necessarily. I mean you care about, but there are. This is geared towards Chittenden County, right? But it's a good it's a good uh, tool to sort of see the types of things that you can that you can do. And and you have you still have clauses on most of these things in your in your land use regulations, right? So just keeping in mind that some of those changes count for as climate planning um, as far as the state and the federal government is concerned. You know, there are things here that just in terms of when you are planning for infrastructure, and I know wastewater is something that we wanted to talk about maybe later on, and I have a few resources on that, but, um, you know, when you're putting in that system, if you want to, if you want to, you know, go for that super high efficient pumps, if you want to go for a siting, potentially, you know, solar rooftop on your facility and or with backup storage, that will make you, your electricity bill much smaller, which can be quite big for um, our, ta our towns, that, our smaller towns that have wastewater facilities, those do tend to be quite a big, that's a big monthly bill. I'll just put it that way. That's also something that you'd like to have critically operating at all times. So it is the perfect place to site storage, backup storage, right? Um, and so then when you're thinking about where you might be putting that facility, are there other places, <laughs> other critical operations that you might also want to have backup storage for? So th these are the types of things that like, is this gonna pay for the whole wastewater thing? This particular part, no, but it might give you part of that funding stacking so you can site it where you want to do that combo on-site generation and storage, right? So I'm asking basically, to like, yeah, a little bit blow up the project to the ideal and then see if we can fund it as a puzzle, which is tough. But I think I think this is a great way to bring to draw down funding right now. You know, we'll see. Maybe in a few years you might be cursing me. I hope not. <laughs> um, and I just want to sort of uh, go through at least um, some of the, you know, on the right side here for our carbon sequestration, our conservation, our resilience. And just to mention that I think that keeping working in natural landscapes intact for climate change resilience is really important for a whole bunch of other reasons as well, obviously. I hope that's obvious. <laughs> um, I also don't think that, um, and I, you know, I, this may be the most controversial thing I say this evening, I don't think that it has to be inherently at odds with renewable energy generation, and I think that we do tend to sometimes talk about them as like sort of competing, but there are plenty of ways to, you know, if you have, um, you know, uh, to do dual land use basically in a way that works really well for a landowner. Um, we see some mostly with agrivoltaics, so it's having solar in your fields. They provide shade for uh, grazing animals now that we're experiencing more hot days and more sun. <laughs> like there are plenty of ways um, that you might think about it. I'll, so all I'm saying is just um, there's some pretty creative folks across our state and some in our region that are doing pretty cool things with dual land use. And so I just want to sort of flag that out as um, I think they really can work hand in hand um, and be balance, balanced, um, and I think that's really important for their, you know for our social infrastructure as well. You know, we, we need we need uh, we need those lands and we need we need those lifestyles, but we also we need a little energy to, to make sure that we can can function. Um, and so I just want to say that I think um, you know energy does underpin our social infrastructure. So just want to throw that out there. Um, you know, I've also seen some really interesting, well, we've been having some interesting conversations um, at the office, too, about um, balancing some of these things. So, for example, you were talking about a dam this evening, um, you know, balancing dam removal um, with uh, flood dams that can help with flood control with hydropower, 
those can have really competitive, competing um, sort of interests. And so kind of coming together and saying like, okay, what would our ideal be for each situation? I think is another just sort of example of where you might be surprised how both energy and climate resilience can come into some of these sort of like gray infrastructure conversations. So I just offer that um, there. There's a whole bunch of other stuff we could talk about here, um, both the left and the right side. On the left side, we can talk about, you know, um, creating maximum driveway lengths, and if you go over, then you contribute to a community benefit agreement, and that will help residents co up, cover the upfront costs of weatherization. I mean, you can get creative as you want, right? Um, and I just offer that as, as sort of a, there's, there's, there's room here to dream a little bit um, and see how we can meet everybody's needs. All right, next slide, thank you. I also have time, okay, I have a little time. Housing, so I have a few slides on housing. Uh, this is obviously not comprehensive, and I know that you're meeting with some of our um, colleagues. Uh, is it next week, two weeks? Maybe someone from the Planning Commission is? Uh, Shall we speak Planning Commission? Yep, yeah. Planning Commission. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, housing will not be something that we talk about uh, and move on. It'll be something that we're talking about for years here in our state. Um, I just sort of, in terms of planning considerations, when you're thinking about your plan and also thinking about, um, some of your regulations and also dreaming again. There are tons of different ways um, that energy and climate and resilience can come up in housing. So I'm just highlighting a few. Uh, one I'm a big fan of, sorry Brian, is waste heat recovery. <laughs> right, so when we're siting our, uh, when you're thinking about siting some houses, is there, you know, an indoor ice rink that, that's, we don't have that many in our region. But um, <laughs> I'm just giving you all the examples. Anywhere with refrigeration, you know, um, anywhere that needs to stay cool that might be giving off, um, any sort of industrial processes that might be giving off some waste heat, that instead you can capture and funnel right back into a neighboring uh, multi-unit housing uh, dwelling, for example. Um, and basically that means that whatever your heating system is, whether it be electric or not, you have to heat from just a much, you know, a much more moderate temperature to get back to that um, condition that you want, right? Same goes for geothermal. So if you want to take it from the ground, you can do closed loop systems. There's a lot of different groups working on this across the state. Um, uh, and basically you're then heating from the, about that 50 degrees underground um, back either up, you know, usually up, <laughs> um, to that 65 to 70 in your, in your house. Um, those systems are uh, more expensive up front, but do have, you know, they're very long lasting and they have a lot of um, cost benefits um, to the users. And right now is when we have those federal pro programs that could offset those upfront capital costs. So I am always going to mention waste heat, also waste heat recovery from your waste water, just to confuse things, wastewater obviously comes out of our homes at approximately body temperature. So you got a lot of heat that you can take off that, either on site or at the facility, and use that, use that heat, again, putting it into approximate building as a heating source. So there are really clever, quite simple, pretty old ways of doing things that we can totally use as we vision, um, um, sort of envision how we're moving forward. Um, and so I just sort of wanted to, whether you add heat pumps onto that or not, you can have that as a separate conversation, right? Um, they're just some of these basic things of, let's also make sure we're lose, using less. Let's, let's not, dim, you know, we, there are ways to curb our demand and to capture what we're already sort of just, what's already out there. So just want to bring that up. Um, again, the flood resilience, I think, is on everyone's mind. So obviously, where, where we're putting them um, and what it's going to take to put them there. Uh, community resilience hubs is one you're going to see um, over and over and over again. But as we know that we're experiencing um, sort of increasingly more extreme conditions, um, making sure that we have uh, somewhere where people can go, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, there are funding, a lot of different uh, funding <laughs> programs that are considering how would we fund community resilience hubs? What does that look like? There's a national group that is very much focused on urban centers. There's a whole bunch of us that are working and asking the question, how do we do this in a rural place? What does a rural community resilience hub look like? Um, and myself and colleagues at the Vermont uh, Council on Rural Development have actually held a few webinars on this, just imagining, like, imagining sessions about like, what does that mean for us here? Um, and the cool thing about this is you know, you're looking to stack funding both for that resilient, affordable energy, also for staff training. So you want to help those people who need it the most. That usually does require some, um, some expertise and experience. 
Um, and so, you know, just keep in mind that some of these programs um, that are, are going to ask both for sort of that greenhouse gas emissions reductions um, component and also well-being, which, like, frankly, I'm quite happy to see as, you know, a, a, a main thing you need to sort of justify or explain how you're improving your community. Um, I will try not to, to blather on too much here, but, you know, there's the fill in the blank ready, <laughs> you know, so, you know, you can either, whether, whether you're putting some sort of standard in or whether you're doing some community outreach and engagement work, whether you're working directly with developers, you know, the town can decide what role they want to play, if at all. But, you know, having conversations about, you know, please don't put in electrical panels that can't be connected to, you know, EV chargers or to, you know, solar panels or to, um, you know, a variety of things, micro, you know, grid storage, you know, battery walls, etc. Those are things that the town can do. Um, or you can leave yourself the space to, to, to do that um, after you know, you're taking some time to think about it. And the same thing goes for the, for the waste heat recovery I was talking about earlier. Um, there's a lot here. Um, obviously, I have that thing about resilient, efficient, and healthy housing. We do have res residential building energy standards at the state. You, municipalities have the authority uh, to hire officers if they want. Obviously, that burden is really high. We have some towns in our region that are thinking about um, you know, banding together, or what would that look like? And some uh, towns that have folks that are very involved in the update to the standards, you can adopt stretch code if you want. You don't have to do that either. You can also, you know, um, in some of your planning, just mention that we have them and make sure that they're available, um, you know, uh, in your town office. I mean, this goes for all of those things down there. Uh, again, I am not, you know, not telling you you should or shouldn't do anything, but these are just all ways forward in this regard. Next. Yeah. So we got an um, email request that you would slow down. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just a text. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, friends on Zoom, all for coming. I apologize. I have to go take care of some business myself. Thank you. Absolutely. Actually, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know where you stand in relationship to Woodbury or if you moved up or down. 
But the thing that I really want to mention is that the MERP program, Municipal Energy Resilience Grant Program, did take that into consideration for prioritization of towns. But there has been no indication yet that that will necessarily play into um, eligibility for future programs. It will for the Municipal Energy Resilience Grant Program. But I will say that the, the, there are very different uh, indices that the federal government uses, right? So for Justice 40, so a lot of the climate energy programs that, that the state's going to be getting funding from um, have different metrics that they use. And that's, that really hyper -focus, focuses on places like Barry City, on Winooski, on several places like that in our state. Um, and so what I always say, and I, this is what I did in our applications too, is if you have a reason why you think that indice does not reflect your town, and or there's a piece of the indice where you say, okay, overall we don't qualify or we're not eligible for extra prioritization, but if you look for a really big outlier in these three areas of the indice, out of 36 or something, then, then let's talk about that in the little space that they give you for justification. So it's not, I don't think it's meant to, leave anybody out, but it is it's meant to shine light on folks uh, on folks that may not have been prioritized in the past. But so when we write out an implementation grant, there is an opportunity yes. to... Yes. Uh, I have, yes, but I'm very vocal about that. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the other things that will be taken into account for that are, like, geography, to spread it out around across the state, right? Um, is, um, like, types of communities, smaller or larger, those that need a lot of admin support from us, those who may not, like, they really want to do a mix. Um, I have advocated repeatedly that um, communities that are hit by the flood, that should be considered. I also advocated that if they don't get the report in enough time before the grant, then that needs to be considered in before the application. So, no, and I'm always happy to hear um, additional things. And I will say that we've, I, I mean, I don't have that much precedent, I have two years but here, but I, I've been um, really impressed with, um, that the folks that are creating a lot of these programs, they, they are very willing to hear I, our ideas of, of prioritization and of, um, and of what, you know, what kind of questions to ask um, so that you, can, that you can really represent yourself well. Yeah, and I, I will say though that Vermont is interesting, um, that federally, uh, even without, they don't consider transportation and energy burden at the federal level, they only consider the electric and the thermal sectors that even with that, Vermont is still highly energy burdened compared to a lot of other um, places. And that I, I do think comparatively, even despite the severe challenges we face, um, even, I, I think we are still a little bit of a wealthier state compared to some of our, you know, some other rural states. I think that you know, it's changing and we, we also do have a lot of folks that are unhoused um, at a higher rate than many other states, so that, that might change things. But, um, it is interesting to see that that burden still persists um, despite that, and so I think really seriously thinking about a lot of these things, like okay, like we're not we're using a lot, um, and that's and it's difficult for our residents to 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 pay for it. Um, is that is that quantified by volume or cost? Uh, um, for this energy burden, it's by cost. Yeah. The, the components are mm -hmm. medium household income. Electricity spending, mm -hmm. thermal spending, transportation spending. energy spending, mm -hmm. total energy spending, total energy burden, and the uh, and it's broken down into six categories. Yeah. Catalyst is at the highest, uh, well, but anyway, the, the most disadvantaged when that becomes a criterion for a grant. Mm -hmm. And our neighbor Woodbury is at the lowest. It just boggles my mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to wrap yes, of up soon. Yeah. Could you? Yeah. Absolutely. And we'd like to have a few minutes for yeah. discussion. Yes, yeah, please, please. Could, so. means, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can move to the next slide. So yeah, so here I'm just going to say that here's a bunch of wastewater resources. I just want you to know that these programs exist. We don't need to talk about it, but you should know that um, several of these will be closing within the next like few months to a year. So please do reach out to us for support um, on, um, on them if, you, if you'd like it. Um, that's all I really need to say on this one. Are we gonna get copies of these? Yes, slides? absolutely, 100%. You already have the, you already have the slides. I even left all of you. So uh, I just wanna say that there's so much 
uh, in energy efficiency and conservation. Again, um, this is where I was going to talk about the Municipal Energy Resilience Grant Program. You are leading, you know, by example through that program. Definitely, I, you know, I would really, really recommend um, that this is where, you know, uh, to my emails, to staff emails, you know, to come together once we get those reports and say, okay, what do you want to do with your assets? Um, and what kind of projects are you looking at? What do you want to piggyback on this <laughs> um, so that we can do some funding stacking? And what needs might you be able to meet with some of your community members, right? So, you know, if it makes it a better application to say, hey, you know, we're going to do a cooling or war warming shelter. Do you actually want to do that? Um, is that a need that you have? Um, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of different things like that that we can talk about. Um, I think those are things that are increasingly needed. Um, uh, and so just the, the point here is just to say, you know, again, crosstalk is really important about different people's needs, both who are working for and at the municipality or volunteering for them, but also uh, in your broader community. So definitely looking for those opportunities to, um, to sort of pair up needs, um, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, these are, yeah, you are the fixture of your community in a lot of ways. So, um, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, stuff here, and I will, I will put the, what I was going to talk about um, in the notes on the slides, but basically most of the federal funding, like that 50, was it, 70, over 70 million is going to be distributed, basically a lot of that at the, um, at the individual level, resident level. So making sure that you gear up to, or thinking about how you might gear up and play a role in um, community education is really important. If you have that $4,000 for the Municipal Energy Resilience Grant Program, you could do a community build of some sort, you can do, you can partner with um, some champions and little office hours with food, like whatever you want to do, you can do, you can do. Um, but just, you know, some ideas about that and then also how to um, sort of perpetuate some of that uh, with um, additional funding opportunities. So, um, like next talk, slide. Oh, yeah. The question is, and I know we're rushed for time, and it's the reason for my question, I was wondering, uh, Maybe some Saturday, we could uh, you could avail yourself if we could put together like a community wide brainstorming session. You could educate yeah. us. We could kind of figure out what needs are. Maybe residents come here with mm -hmm. their our houses are leaky like sieves. Mm -hmm. We individually need help, but the, the community might have some ideas too that bring there. We could kind of put together lists, and then we know where to focus our attention in terms of grants, so we don't miss out on. Absolutely. Yeah, you'd be willing to do that. I'd be willing to do that, absolutely. Wow. Also, our That's colleagues awesome. at Vermont um, House on Rural Development do like really specialize in those community visioning sessions. Oh, and, and then you can invite me as a participant. Um, but I'm happy to facilitate, happy to participate, um, absolutely. And I will, I just want to highlight that um, we just have an ex like really impressive you know, folks like you across our region that are also doing this in our own towns. And I, I end this with a picture of you know, all of our, um, on all of our energy committees and stuff, because, you know, you're all a resource for each other, so one of the things I'm trying to do is get you all to meet each other more regularly, <laughs> but there are so many meetings, so I understand, but, you know, that's, that's the dream of mine, is to provide you some stuff, but then give you the space to talk to one another, what works, what doesn't, do you want to do it together, even better, right? So I'm supporting, for example, the window dressers, so we're going to do some community-wide uh, projects like that. Those are little window inserts. They help meet acute heating needs in your residence. Little wooden frames, double wrapped, specifically measured. Like, go like that to seal the leaky window, right? Super easy. Okay. Next slide. Don't take too long. We'll get to the end. Uh, there's so much on renewable energy generation. Um, so much, so much. It's more than siting. Siting is important, but um, it's more than that, the way the town can participate. You can, um, you know, do a whole variety of things. I did three municipal solar workshops about different ways that municipalities can participate. I'll add those links. <laughs> don't need to go into it now. I do want to highlight, if you don't mind, the next slide. Just the one at the top. Sustainable energy for schools and municipal programs is due March 1st. This is twenty-five to $250,000 for the installation of either new advanced wood heat, uh, new solar PV, um, cold climate heat pumps or repairs of existing such systems. I just really don't, I just couldn't leave without you seeing this. There, there, we worked, I worked with the Public Service Department on making sure that this is accessible um, to you all. Uh, they're thinking about ways to make sure the upfront costs aren't too heavy, um, the application is pretty light, um, and I'm happy to look over, um, you know, narrative. So please think about this, especially in combination with the Municipal Energy Resilience. Is this program. likely to be available next year? I, I don't think we're going to make it this year. Yeah. 
Yes, I can say for sure, but likely yes. And this is the first time after you know a, quite a lot of advocacy that it doesn't. It, it does include wood heat and PVs and solar. So we're seeing expansion of some of our state programs, which I think is excellent because you really want to diversify, <laughs> diversify what you're using. That's best for for you know the place that you're in. Next, next slide. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, there's too much here. This is for your fleet efficiency. I'm happy to meet with anybody who's interested in fleets. Happy to meet with your garage um, folks, your road crew and road foreman, both about making the garage more comfortable for them, also talking about equipment. Um, also, you know, there's other stuff in transportation besides fleet efficiency and electrification, you know, bike walk roll infrastructure, you know, uh, road materials and treatments. Um, walk to shop campaigns. There's a huge variety of stuff here. You've got these ideas. You've got these resources. I even put the key emails on there. So don't hesitate. I can come back and talk about any of these things. All right, next slide, please. All right, we're going to have to cruise through the next slides, actually. Enhanced energy planning is uh, something that you can do. <laughs> uh, I, can, I can support you through it. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward, actually, if you don't mind, next slide. Um, for, we're redoing our enhanced, our regional enhanced energy plan right now. Uh, next slide, if you don't mind, sorry. Um, that's a great slide, but next slide. <laughs> um, here we go. I actually already am going to be providing you your drafts of your analysis and your targets and your mapping, whether you want them or not, because they're part of our regional enhanced energy plan. You do not have to adopt them. You don't have to look at them. However, I'm going to send them to you anyways and say, here they are. Do you want to talk about enhanced energy planning? I can come back and chat with you or your planning commission. Um, we have a cohort of about five to seven towns who are currently working on them. So you'd be in very good company. Um, and in fact, I'd like to get uh, towns that are doing it together, uh, together, um, so I don't have to go. I mean, I love spending time in each of the towns, but we'll do some of it together as a group. Also, because that's a great way to get ideas, right? Very, very, very simply, you get analysis and targets from me. Those come down from the state's goals. Um, you get mapping that has, uh, you know, that um, is that builds on the state um, that adds some regional constraints, and you are able to also look at um, some adding some or, or even better highlighting some preferred siting on your own. Um, and then the key part of this is pathways. What are you actually going to do? <laughs> and the pathways part, I think, is the least prescribed, um, and that's because it's probably the most important. And it's like, what's actually going to work for you in these fields? All right, next, next. Thank you. Sorry. All right, um, these are just some recommendations about how to move forward from this conversation. Um, again, I just want to repeat this one, this one phrase, identify existing goals and projects that have co-benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and building community resilience is a great way forward. <laughs> so what do you already need to get done that you've been having on the back burner and does it have greenhouse gas emissions reductions? Let's find a way to get some funding stacking and make it happen. Right now is the time to draw down that capital investment <laughs> um, and, and make sure that we have resilient infrastructure, physical and social, moving forward. Let's see what was that. All right, I think maybe we'll just end it up there. Yeah, key partners. Uh, those are some key websites that you can look at where they uh, keep track as of, of as much funding as possible. Um, and then again, just one last pitch for CVRPC newsletter, digest, and our staff reports. I know that they're dry, but there's a lot of good info there. So please take a look. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> I told you this would be a whirlwind. <laughs> we obviously didn't yeah, schedule enough time, but I think you got us thinking. Good. But I want to give people time to ask questions or anybody. I wish you could get excited about this, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're, you're totally invested in this. I love that. I feel like we're going to, at least I, will go back and read those slides Good. and I'll come up with all sorts of things that I want to talk about once I've had a chance to do that. Yeah, I would say we've had a, a fair amount of discussion uh, amongst the board about some of the planning um, uh, initiatives that we've got coming up quite literally this next year yeah. and um, wanting to engage resources like this during the planning process um, uh, so I, you know to John's point you know, we, we had already been kind of talking about um, scheduling 
a kind of community event of sorts to kind of get uh, input, uh, at least in the early stages. Um, to, to we, we have one. Yeah, Are we, we have one. Oh, right. there you it. have it, Steve. Mm -hmm. It's on your calendar. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my calendar. I'll be there for sure. One hundred percent, I'll be there. Um, yeah. Um, so looking looking forward to continuing to engage the conversation. Thanks. And I think in addition to the municipal aspect of it. I think finding ways to help residents and nonprofits and small businesses in town take advantage of some of those things. I know I'm involved with a couple that are looking at massive yeah. projects in the next few years that um, are directly energy efficiency projects Great. that are currently unaffordable. So there's a lot of people who would be interested in taking advantage of some of those opportunities. And also take the opportunity to, to, to make a public call to our community. You know, I think it would be great if, uh, if like, our planning commission and um, our conservation commissions were more actively looking to find funding for projects and identifying particular projects. You know, I think we get a little hyper-focused on what kind of policy and regulation changes we can make and, and lose sight of maybe what are the programs that we can be getting involved in? What are the action items uh, and projects that we can get going on that can get funded? Um, that's uh, that, that's really important for rural communities. You know, where's the money coming from? What, what's the money being prioritized towards? Um, and uh, that that would be huge um, to kind of feed feed the conversation. You know, back up to the up to the select boards. Um, makes it a lot more actionable. I'd say that that's the kind of information that we can really benefit from at, at CBRPC as well, just because then we'll have our sort of ears to the ground. You know, we know that X is a priority in Calus. Well, let's make sure that we keep that tacked up there. And if there's funding opportunity that comes by, or we know of one that uh, already exists, then we can. I was saying know. the exact opposite, though. I was saying that you guys are doing <laughs> really good. Though. You know what we should be prioritizing, but yeah, it's a two-way conversation. You're absolutely right. You know, um, I, I, it's just hard to stay on top of all of the conversations and all of the opportunities. Um, but yeah, I, I took a note. You know, I think it would be great as a municipality if we were managing a list of the projects that we knew were on the immediate horizon, um, and then if we do have that that set list of things. And it's public enough that each of the commissions can keep it on top of mind for their for their meetings, um, so that we can look at it from a couple of different lenses. Uh, well, let's meet in the middle. You come yeah. up with some ideas, yeah. and then we'll tell you That's if fair. we think yeah. it's fundable or not. Yeah. I don't. I don't think yeah. we envision our role as telling you what your priority should be. No, so, no. no I'll tell you where the money is. That. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's all we're asking. I'll tell you what your priority should be based on where the money is. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> one of my recommendations is, is really that um, is that shared is those shared resources right we do tend to institutionalize within one person's mem memory right. oh this one person knows all these things which that's awesome however you know how do we get that a little bit more visible um, and also just expertise share it, you know there might be someone in town that's like oh I can do that you know that's really important too you know it's really engaging folks to say hey we need your skills Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. My voice is a little hoarse, though. I must have said well. No, you've given us a lot to think about and digest. All right. What's the point? Thanks, all. Thanks. Thank you so much. We, we are really fortunate, obviously, that's a great step. Every year it's better and better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. When do we have to make a decision about the two projects? Oh, right. Sorry? When do we have to make a decision about the two projects and deciding to oh, East commit Calus. to East Calus and the... Um, in terms of moving forward? Yeah. If, if you are still interested, we can move forward as soon as you would like. Okay. I'll reach out. Okay. Yeah, that's... Yeah. And take the next step. Yeah. Sounds like we're interested. I, I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to miss an action on no, it. I know you were delegated to be a conduit. But that sounds good. All right. Thank you. There are a lot of people who are assuming that those projects are going forward. People and Pam are on the people in the
years back too, and she's like, it's like could ask it about it. Oh yeah. That filtration. I'll connect you with Chris. I think it's, okay. his flag will be big enough to put that in. That's how we might want to know. <laughs> you really I didn't know sure. about it. I didn't know. Yeah, I just remember they kept asking, and no one had any information on it. It was a while back. It's like some Chinese yeah. thing. Yeah. It's been going on a long time. Yeah. We were all there. Thank you. Also recognize John for all the years he has been a delegate from for commissioner of BC and commissioner has worked with Merv. <laughs> That's right. I didn't even say that. This all came about because John called me and said and he's the rep, our representative to the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. We tried to there's a lot get of us more engaged. I had more time now to do yeah. this stuff. Yeah. So thanks. I saw money. Yeah. yeah. We, we need to get some injected here. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. All right. Now we're going to talk about town meeting. So, Kari, you have been working hard. You've prepared a couple of documents for us. All right. So there's two documents in the folder. Uh, one is, uh, call it the article plan. So it basically goes through the articles that you assigned who was going to be the lead for each. Maybe proactively, maybe if questions come up. And then there's some talking points associated with almost all of them. So very drafty, but um, something to work from. So he's talking about the, the document where he's highlight our names. Mm -hmm. Who's going to yeah. move which article and speak to those articles? So, uh, yeah, I thought it was very comprehensive. You don't have to write the whole narration. Like, it's <laughs> 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 there is like, oh, wow, he's already done it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was just one perspective. There might be additional points, but it, something to get started with. Um, yeah, and, and, and the idea wasn't to practice tonight, but just to make sure we all understood our roles and were comfortable with them. Yeah. And the questions I enjoyed, especially the one at the end where there was like nothing. <laughs> like they all had like lots of answers. I can't remember which question it was, but what it was. So that's the other document is the anticipated questions. Yes. And that one let's spend a little time. With. There's there's room for more questions. There's room for more answers, better answers. Um, some some of them I haven't drafted a response to at all yet. So. Oh, I thought that was because it was no response. Yeah, That's why we talked about. It may not be in like, some cases. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're very. Look, let's let's turn to that document. It's it says anticipated town meeting questions. Starts off with overarching questions, and I think it would be good if we talked particularly about that first one because I think it's highly likely we will get that one. If we were going to cut, and seventeen thousand dollars cuts one percent, what could we cut? And Kari's given us a proposed list here. There are other things. Well, we have already invested in that. Did we already start that mapping program? We have not committed anything. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah. we, we've already paid the 3000 probably. <laughs> no, we have not. We haven't okay. signed the contract. And I put it off till after town meeting okay, to see if we wind up cutting it. Get so that will be one of the items on okay. the first meeting after town meeting, is either signing it or not. And we might need to work around the Ken Hill grant. That's a pretty huge thing to be setting this aside. Is, been a lot of work we've put into it. And I think it's important too, I think it's a very um, wanted, I'm like our filtration system, which apparently only Scott and I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, no, I don't but like I don't it. I, I'm happy right. to take it off this yeah. list. It's just, it's hard to come but up with chunks of yeah. money, as you know, because we went through this line by line and already scrubbed yeah. it a couple times. Well, then I know that East Montpelier, I don't perceive us doing that, but I know like with their road budget, they got to a place and they're like, sorry, we can't afford that guy anymore. Okay. <laughs> you know, or just, you can't do any more overtime, you don't have the money for it. So right. okay. keep it to your 40 hours, you know. Um, Jamie, you wanted to say something? Oh, I was just concurring with Ann that I feel like the Kent Hill has been a project that a lot of time and energy has gone into thus far. But yeah, I mean, I think it's 
find would be on the list. Yeah, yeah well, uh, we can talk about it. Maybe we will express that. And, and that's not the scoping. Okay, right. This is the, the, one the one French mattress project? Yeah. Although that's going to be a challenge to get someone to go into it. But, but that's, in, that is, yes, that's the French mattress. That was in the budget. Yeah. 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 So that's 5K. And how much does that add up to? Let's just suppose we took everything off of there, Carl. What's the total? It's 26 and a half. 26. Oh, I see. There it is. 1.6%. It's, it's like a French drain, but it's a mattress. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. And, then you, and then you see the what is going on. Like uh, could, could we just have one conversation going? Thank you. So in this scenario, if we were to reduce all of that, 26,500, it would be approximately, based on my calculations, $13 per 100,000 of property value in tax, <coughs> tax deductions. Say that again, please. So if we if we reduce all of these items, twenty six and a half thousand dollars, it would translate to a tax savings of thirteen dollars per hundred thousand of value, property value. Which you know, that's the way people will have to think about it. Like yeah. what am I giving up? Yeah. So, and what am I saving? Right. So this is supposing somebody at town meeting says, Hey, we gotta cut this back further. We can say here's Here's what we thought. One idea. This is what we would have cut next, but we didn't want to cut. I think the Conservation Commission might be a little... Oh, everyone's going to be prickly. That's... that's Sorry, you know, so I, I didn't hear what we were I, saying. I think taking all 5000 of the $5,000 for the Conservation Fund might uh, get some responses. I would think so, yes. <laughs> Everything else, you, it seems like you took a portion of a lot of the things, but that was a full removal. Um, and I will say for the technology reserve fund, we are going to have to replace the servers in a couple of years. We will need that money. If we want to put it in another year, we can. It doesn't need to be in there next year, but it will need to be in there to, to buy the new servers when we get there. So you see that reserve funds are at the top of the list because the thinking is, oh, we can put it on this deferred maintenance kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Um, the technology, I figure, just for the reason you're saying, it's sort of mission critical. We're going to have to pay. If not next year, we're going to have to come up with a, a year following. But it's up to you if you want to do it, whichever year. Now, Carl, you didn't put in uh, don't do the grader this year. Correct. So if that were removed, um, and, it, that, and that might fail, right, as its own item, that would mean no interest payment in FY25. Oh, so, there's, so that's actually $10,000, so that's in that first line. Oh, that's what you're saying. You Okay. But I, I didn't put it in there just because it sort of a, it's already on the ballot elsewhere. Right. It gets more complicated, but that's certainly something to talk about. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that, or are we feeling pretty well prepared to deal with that one if it happens? I, I suspect people are going to be more fired up about that education cost um, probably than we were really hard to be fired. It's mm -hmm. I don't know. So so comparatively. No. Yes. <laughs> one can help. One, we, I mean, let's hope. Well, no, but a lot of towns have gone. I think we worked really hard to get it mm -hmm. down as much as we could. So. Uh, Ari, did we put the anticipated questions up there so that people have your questions? Sure. Is that oh, we feel like John. Are there Do still a time? lot of people with us? Uh, I don't know, sure. but John, John John's, asked, John's so he, he can't look at this at the moment. Oh. <laughs> oh, I don't have an extra one to give you. Well, we've got this handy dandy screen share. Looks like everybody, most people have left. And, yeah. Uh, so be here it is. So what they were just discussing, John, was if somebody at town meeting said, cut the budget by 1%, what items that could bring that down by 1% is what they were just discussing. Have, you guys have a list in them. Yeah. A possible list. So, yeah, 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 yeah. This is Ideas the starting the point. Find yeah. savings. So, you know, need this. And you have a goal. Um, Support of a goal toward like what you're trying to reduce 
budget by? No, we have already, 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 already done that. We've already done that. Oh, okay. This, so this is, is a what if, a contingency. Okay. Or if on the floor someone says, okay. hey, what can we do to reduce it by 1 to 2%? Yeah. 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 Maybe they ask for uh, 5 or 10. I don't know. Okay. But well, one, so 1% one is 17,000. Mm -hmm. And then here's a list. And that, you know, that's just one Some man's things. perspective. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ideas. You know, I've been, uh, I'm moving on now, all right? The next question is, how much did the flood cost us? It occurs to me that it would be good to be getting FEMA updates. I had a conversation with Toby yesterday in which he told me we've actually received some FEMA funding. We haven't seen a check yet, but the, the first reimbursement request was approved, is what we're told. So. Uh, and that was for Moscow? Was no, that was for the Curtis Pond Dam, because that was an emergency. That had to wow, go first. I see. And that's like 20 something thousand, 23,000, I believe. Right. So that's, you know, as Sandra said, it's the first drop uh, you know, of rain in the, in the storm, you know, so hopefully it's an indicator of more to come. So, what percentage of that work effort are they covering? Just what we did last summer. The entirety of it? Well, that was $30,000. Same rate so, as 75%. Plus, 75%. plus the state, maybe wow. another 12 and a half. That's the idea. So it's gone to the state now, I guess. Is that right? Correct. The state will actually write the check. Yeah. Yeah. And then we we are not to the point yet of applying for the additional twelve percent from the state, but yeah. we're we're on our way. So Moscow was is the sec was the, the second, second thing one. submitted. Right. And you know, there's just layers of review, but it was very encouraging to hear that we've finally gotten one product through. Yeah. Yeah. So next we should hear in the Moscow Woods and that is for that's a big one. Oh, uh, yeah, almost 500. Shh. It's, it's the single oh, biggest. Oh, it's only half. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's right. That's, that's, that's a third of our total request. Right, right. right. Yeah. yeah. Single to the big day. Okay. Yeah, it'd be good. It'd be good to hear your reports if you could keep us uh, in the loop on that. Let's sure. Sure. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think that one's pretty easy to answer. Anyone want to talk about that one? If anybody asks about the flood, okay. we delegate it to Kari. <laughs> <laughs> and you got grant funding, hopefully coming for Bliss Pond, right? All that work. That would be one of the ones we. So you all those, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 not all in yet. I think some of right. the small ones Correct. are still going the, in. The smaller ones are still still working on. Yeah. So maybe if you had a list of all the big projects you did, and then status, right. so people are going to ask. There were a lot of them. There were. There's about 30 roads. Oh, okay. I thought it was 50. Was it 50? Well, it depends. They group it down. So there could be what they call two projects on one road. Oh, okay. yeah. because of just like because we had an upper and a lower. Okay. Thank you. So I don't know. I think there's more like 80 projects, right? When you get to it, separate um, requests that will all be treated as separate. Projects. These would have been great questions for Scott. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I assume Scott and Toby will be there. Yeah, I just met you with those here just yeah. moments ago. Yeah. No, that's all right. Well, I, I will have a lot of help with this if it comes down to those kinds of details. Uh, what's the next one? I think that the next one's pretty obvious. Could we use the FEMA funding? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Will we get reimbursed? And why can't we reduce our budget in anticipation of FEMA funding? Hmm. So we're not getting 100% reimbursed. We're, we're at best, getting 87%, 88%, which is really going to help replenish. You know, we had a fund balance, and it's basically gone now, and, and we need to um, build back up those those funds. And that's another important point. We're getting to the point where we're going to have to draw our loan, aren't we? Yeah, I was going to provide a report uh, on that. When you talk about that. We have okay. a financial report after this. Oh, right. Okay. So. All right. Everybody comfortable right. so far? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Let's move past FEMA. FEMA. Why do we need <laughs> 
town, town administrator. Town administrator. Um, that, I think that one's pretty easy. I would add to the list that you gave us, Kari, uh, handling day-to-day -day operations. You say the TA has a few key functions. I mean, a big one is just handling what goes on day-to-day, -day, which we were doing up until the time you came on. Sure. Um, and also, you gather a lot of information for us that helps us with the decisions we make. That formerly had, you had to rely on us to get all the information. Yeah. With help from the staff, but yeah. it's just been huge. Yeah, I'd, I'd add, or emphasize the informed decisions, right? Uh, we're, we're, yeah. we're a community relying heavily on, like any rural community, on, on volunteer uh, labor and people who have day jobs and, and part of making informed decisions is making sure that we're brought the information um, and that has been hugely beneficial even um, even in the brief period of time that we've had Kari dedicated to that work. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong in saying this is a long overdue mm -hmm. um, filling of the position. It's, we've been struggling for more than a decade. So. Yeah. Um, Kari, you're going to have a problem with, isn't it too much to be all the things you're going to do? Increase in their school no. budget. No school. Oh, Forty okay. percent. <laughs> oh, because they were counting on that five percent cap. Yeah, that's gone. Right, yeah. Senate Finance Chair and Cummings received over a hundred emails from the town of Stowe. <laughs> and there's a lot of blame in there. Yeah. Of course, right? Well, what's Stowe's going? What is Stowe's? Well, they're they're freaked out. I'm sure they're still going back to the Brigham decision. You know. Um, the, oh, the, the, the education fund, yeah. you know, and the reallocation of yeah. wealthy towns monies, but uh, yeah. it's just Montpelier, 20% increase. Senator Ann Cummings, Chair Ann Cummings, said that her own, um, the property taxes on her own house will increase by $2,000. Mm -hmm. She's freaked. She's Fine. retired. Right. You're going up three. Three? Where do you live? Montpelier. So, good. John, you'll be at the meeting and you can talk about this if it, uh, it winds up being a discussion. Huh. Well, I think it's going to be the, yeah, the school you thing. Get out of here, man. <laughs> I already did. Yeah. We didn't so, vote on so it. I still own the house. Uh, if people want to talk about schools, 
to the town meeting the place to do it? Uh, but we have no control over right. schools. We don't know so if they're going to do the school budget. They're talking about postponing it. That, yeah. Yeah. That's going to be Australian ballot, isn't it? But they're talking yeah. about not doing Probably a town meeting, meeting today, right? Doing it. Yeah, I, yeah. So I they can go back and do a do-over now. They don't have their five percent cap, so it's like, do you really want to take twenty-five percent increase? Because yeah. you're going to have to pay the whole thing. Yeah, no, I think, I then am I correct in understanding that, that, that like they're looking at this year being very um, unique year, and that there's going to be additional elections, and so moving the Australian ballot to later in the year because they yeah. have the opportunity. Well, not, not that late. It would be April fifteenth. That's the latest date. Yeah. 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 But May, the, right? the point is, with the removal of that cap, if that's right. what actually happens, mm -hmm. it changes the assumptions. Gotcha. And so they're giving schools right. that are affected in that way a chance to redo it. But if that's not on town meeting day warning, isn't it like too late to... It, it might be inappropriate to talk about it at town meeting because it's not a forum for everybody to hear right. about that topic. Mm -hmm. no, I don't think we're allowed to talk about anything. Yeah. No, the, the, the school board is having their own elections and their own hearings and their own everything. Uh, I will have to be in charge of communicating to people how the ballot thing will work if they decide to not do their election. But I, I don't think the school yes. stuff is an appropriate thing to talk about at this meeting. Uh, well, as I say, I, I, I'm pretty sure we're, we can't. If it's on Australian ballot, we cannot talk about it. But it's not our ballot, it's not our election. And so plus, we, well, that's another reason too. But, but that's, it's, it's hard for people to understand that when the ballots are right there and they're voting right there on the ballots. So I, I hear what you're saying, I know, I know what you're saying. But people are saying, but I'm voting on it today. The ballot was right here at the check-in table. And we'll say the hearing was warned. And uh, plus, if they ask us about the road grader, we can't talk about that either. It's on Australian ballot. Right? And because everybody doesn't have the equal chance to hear what we're saying, they may not have come to town here. Well, I guess then that's good context relative to, like, if that comes up relative to the budget and trying to find other savings, and we can't go into a dialogue mm -hmm. around the road That's grader. right. That's right. We can only say right. if you decide not to do it. Right. Boy, this why are why are we spending so much on attorneys is going to be a hard one to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yep. That's the right. first bullet point there. <laughs> 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 Is it entirely driven by that one case, or is there more? Well, I don't actually know. I, I think there's that more. The there, it, there was it, well, and it, it was union negotiation as well. Uh, right. Thank right. you. That's so, right. Thank you, Barbara. But, we, but we've also increased the budget item relative to previous budgets. So you know, I think I think there is an argument to be made that. That the matters that the town is having to manage and oversee are getting more complicated and they're not going to get less complicated. Yeah. You know, so the regulations, whether it's ordinance changes or adjustments um, or, um, uh, you know, standing up for those adjustments, defending those adjustments, uh, uh, we are living in a more litigious world and it is not f fiscally responsible for us to underfund can, like funding for paying of those types of things, and um, we, we need to be careful when we when we think about changing regulations, and we need to make a plan for uh, defending them, and uh, and that's part of it, I would say. Yeah. So I guess that's my responsibility to speak to at the meeting, right? Or cars, cars, yeah. <laughs> Oh, because you're doing the budget. That's right. These things are yours. All of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't Thank remember you. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm doing running the town office um, in any case. Oh, good. Great. And so we'll do it together. Yeah. Okay. Salaries and benefits. I think Kari's answer, shouldn't we pay the road crew more? 
Shouldn't we? Could we pay the road crew less? The that might is, be a question. Yeah. <laughs> I think what the people are going to be saying, generally uh, speaking, they're getting paid well in their well negotiations. I've actually gotten that question, that question a few times now. Is where pay them more. Pay them more. Yeah. Pay them more. Yeah. yeah. But it, or, the answer kind of works both ways. It's, yeah. it, well, we bargain. It's not up to us. Yeah. Amazing yeah. insurance yeah. benefits. Right. Right. So. Right. Yeah. It's a bad it's, it's, it's a happy it's story, good. actually, I would say. Yeah. You know, we, we worked it out. They're, they seem happy. You know, yeah. now, I mean. mm -hmm. And we're more we're more in line with market, I think, is right. uh, we're beyond it. We're well we're we're an attractive employer at Excellent. this point. And that is, is first. Um that's part of it. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Arguably. And that's why the roads look so good. <laughs> they do. Uh, they do. Drive around. They did before Friday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, but, I mean, that's that's the need, right? You know, yeah. where we we need we need road crew members to be happy with where they are, so that we have roads that we can drive on, and yeah. we're not going to be able to retain them, or we're going to be constantly stuck in trying to find new ones, which is near impossible at this point. So we better we better be on the leading end of competitive. Imagine getting all that good work done, feeling ah, it's done, and then two days later. Mother Nature it's destroys it. Oh my God, it is. It's frustrating. It's so defeating this sound. Yeah. But it's fun driving an excavator. Like, I don't care how many holes you have to dig, it's the nature of the job, right? <laughs> dig okay. the holes and okay. the let's, let's go to the first start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's happening with our treasure? That's obvious. Um, and what's going on with the assessors? I think we all understand that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, any other thoughts about questions we might get on salaries and benefits? Particularly on benefits, no questions on benefits. But I mean, costs are going up; it's beyond yeah. our control. Yeah. And, yeah, and that's like so publicly discussed in just all aspects around the state. So I mean, a lot of people will come in. Yeah. So. Okay. But, but if we looked over the years, medical insurance is the number one driver of this budget <laughs> because it's it's now we budget thirty thousand dollars for over employee on the family. That's our portion. Wow. Now our coverage is, I mean, yes, it's yes, like absolutely. way better than my federal insurance. I actually have to pay probably 20 something thousand a year for my insurance. No, but every insurance has gone up. Unemployment has gone up. Yeah. Everything. I, I mean, I don't know how much we get into the weeds on it, but you know, I, I, any opportunity that I have, an opportunity you know, the chance to get on a soapbox and say, this is our budgeted cost for these benefits. You know, I don't think many people realize how expensive their health policies are, even when they are employee funded yeah. um, or employer funded. Um, and and talking about those numbers are, are good. But if there's a way to do that without getting into a debate on whether we should or shouldn't be, then the night before. And make that point. Okay, volunteers and committees. Jamie, that's you, right? Yeah, you looked at all those. You comfortable with those? Can yeah, I talk about so. any of them? How about why did no one you run for select board this year? <laughs> um, I mean, I mean that's not a question we're <laughs> likely to. Hear. No, I don't think so. But I think that's common when when all incumbents are running for their seat again. And yeah. Um, it's not uncommon. I think what happened in July is, is the answer. Right. Yeah, yeah right. Like that. Who would do this? <laughs> <laughs> that was the right line. It could be worse. We could do the school board with blanks on our ballot. Right. So I'm very yeah. happy with what we have. So the only thing, I agree with what you said, Jamie. The only thing is that people weren't calling the town office and asking, are there, are there current select board members who are up for election? Are they running? People were calling and asking, do, do, are you getting, can, do you need candidates? Pe people were or were not? Were not. Yeah. We heard of one person who was thinking about it, and um, then we never saw a petition, mm -hmm. so. We also didn't ask. Last year there were committees, right. and there, were, like, there was a lot of buzz about, we need new people. And this year, none of us went out there and said, come on, well, we're we're 
well, the store it, like five times. Yeah. These are the open positions. I mean, at the store, a lot of people ask me, like, are there people running for these positions? Yeah. And I could say, yes, there are people who have filled out, you know. Um, yeah, we weren't getting those calls at the town office. Um, what's this question? Why is there no longer a grace period on tax payments? I'm not sure what that one's about. Oh, it used to be we had two weeks. So when if your taxes were due on the 15th of November, you had, I believe it was two weeks until the 30th to get it in without penalty. No, it, so it, was both, it was both payments. Both it payments. September and November. Yeah. It was two weeks. For the last couple of years, it was one week. And this past year, it was zero. And why, why was that? Because, because it was not included on last year's town warning as an article to be approved. And oh, yeah, it was it included in this year's town warning? No. no. Oh. So we hope nobody asks, but somebody probably will. And why didn't we put it on? I mean, it never occurred to me to put it on. I didn't even know that it was an issue. Mm -hmm. Isn't it kind of a pain in the butt? Yeah, the, 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 town, the town office doesn't want there to be a uh -huh. grace period. And no one noticed that it wasn't on the ballot last year. Right? Yeah, so we, so John will remember that the town office petitioned, petitioned, petitioned to last, the last select board to please not have that article on the warning. They finally agreed be, because um, Joe McLean got involved and recommended to the select board not, not to have a, a grace period and postmarks accepted. He said, you no, know, he said, you're the only town in Vermont that has both of those. And so the select board asked, which do you recommend? He said, accept postmarks and drop the grace period. So the mm -hmm. former select board finally agreed to that. Nobody at town meeting brought it up. And so okay. it didn't come up. And this year, we again didn't ask for it to be on the warning. Okay. It's a big resource commitment. Tracking it's huge. It can add so. so much more work at the town office when there's a grace period. But now we have Kari, he can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we so don't bring it up. <laughs> and we yeah. hope nobody else brings it up. <laughs> you know, the next questions are I think things that Donnie's gonna be dealing with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's not right here. You know, we can finish this next time if you'd like. Um, we have. Um, is it the next time we're hearing? Yeah, yeah, the next meeting. Yeah, one more meeting before. Um, yeah, maybe we should. But, uh, um, what about others? Are there any on this that we, somebody else? Anne, the, you're yeah, going to do the fire thing. You want to talk about those? Yeah, that's fine. How do those look to you? Yeah, they look fine. <laughs> okay. Anybody have any other thoughts about other questions we should be considering? Is the select board for from here on forward going to be meeting at six? Yeah. I mean, you probably was just want to make that announcement at town meeting because they've, they've been meeting at six for last year. But the town website says seven. So it does. Oh, well, yeah. maybe that's uh, what we well, should fix. We should just, um, <laughs> to be fair, we did just recently adopt uh, the new rules and procedure. uh, procedures. On your page. Yeah, on the site board page. Okay, we'll take Simple care. fix. Yeah, simple fix. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you, you thank you. Uh, and uh, the new regulations, or the new rules that were adopted on that page. The new rules are there. Okay. They're, they're, they're not, I don't know if they're on that page, they're on the ordinance and... Right. I'll make sure they get to that page. Thanks, Tegan. Okay, I think probably we're done with this. Thanks, Carly. This was sure. enormously helpful. Yeah, that's fantastic. And we'll have to try to remember to make sure Donnie feels like he got whatever he needs uh, at the next meeting. Right. I think there will be likely road questions in the being on what's on here okay. that I could anticipate. Yeah. Why don't you feed them to Kari? Yeah, we can have that. Yes, yeah. Plus, yeah. yeah. actually, some of those class four things. Just based thing. on questions I get regularly exactly. from the store. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're going to come around again. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. So I'll be sure to put some time on the next agenda for that. George, I need to put the rules of procedure on the slide. Oh, okay. Thanks. I thought so. 
All right, now we have our, um, what are you calling it, the end of the year financial report? No. Just because it's the last period, the calendar year. No, no, it's only period seven. Oh, oh, why does it say on the agenda July through January? No, that's the fiscal year. Yeah. Fiscal year started in July and we oh. just completed the January period. Oh, okay. okay. Of course, not so, in the year. Okay. So a little over halfway through the year. So, um, yeah, I was actually um, taught how to run these reports and um, did the analysis. So, taking baby steps here. But, um, so one thing I want to alert you to is that if you look at the, um, the budget status report for general government, there's two, one for highway department, one for general government, we are approximately $164,000 short on revenue for general government compared to budget. Sanders estimating we'll have about $70,000 in delinquent tax come in before the end of the year, just a rough estimate. And then there's about $10,000 in clerk revenue for the various licenses and fees. Um, so then beyond that, we have some tax sales planned. I'm not sure what's, what will be the outcome of those. Uh, and then um, there's, a, there's another important thing that's discussed in this report about that in April, there's a true up um, over the tax, um, the, the, the amount of money that we owe to the schools uh, for the tax collection that we do for them. And so that will likely reduce how much we owe them. But the way things are standing, it looks like we're not going to raise the tax collection that was budgeted for this year. I mean, I think, we're, I think we're still below that. And I would have to dig into what the assumptions were in the budget as to, as to why that is. It's not obvious to me, but um, we may have a shortfall. On the expenditure side, uh, I think we're in good shape. We're at 77% of budget for general government. A, a number of those things are front loaded or come in the first half of the year, like the social service appropriations, the fire department ambulance payments. So I think we're good there. And we're 58% of the highway department. I was, I was actually relieved to see that number because January is very expensive mm -hmm. between all the overtime and the gravel. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not out of the woods. So we're, they're, they were running gravel today and they will continue. Um, uh, what season's coming? Yeah, it's here. So, um, but 58% of feel pretty good about that. And then I mentioned the, um, if you look at the balance sheet and the due to from report, both of those show that $272,000 that is owed to the school district, but that is going to be different. It's likely going to be less than that. Um, the state will produce the final bill in April. And then that's when we're expected to make that payment. And then there's also the FEMA report is in here. And that also shows up on the due to from um, 1336316 That's the current um, total, but it does not include employee straight time. It only includes overtime. We will submit a reimbursement for the straight time as well. Um, so that's why we're estimating somewhere in around 1.5 million in total reimbursement. Um, yeah. I didn't understand that sentence after you said that. There were five outstanding invoices paid from the fund. But in January, yeah. So late bills that came in. I mean, from, from the scheme of fund, fund, uh, accounting fund. Oh, it, it's right. just an accounting Why? thing. It's an accounting oh, okay, fund. Okay, I see. Yeah. Thank you. And that's just a call out. We had we had some late invoices come in. It's been a while since any work was done or materials purchased or anything like that. But you know these things happen. Um, so hopefully we're done there. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that. And then so bottom line, our cash position, um, we're still. Okay, for the numbers in here is four four hundred and five thousand nine hundred. Mm -hmm. is what we have in our fund balance. Um, we're still waiting to hear the final determination on the Municipal Climate Relief Funds, the bond banks, cash flow loan program. We don't expect to get the full amount. We applied for 500000 They received requests for $35 million from towns, and they only have $15 million in that fund. So maybe we'll get half, maybe something like that. They're still trying to figure out what their 
methodology will be, but we should hear any, any data mm -hmm. is what, mm -hmm. I'm, what I'm thinking. We may have to supplement that with a line of credit that we have through our bank. But there's also three large unknowns in terms of cash flow. One is, if we sign the contract, construction contract with Larry Hebert, what is the down payment or the first payment that he's expecting? I don't know that. I asked him that recently, and he didn't. Uh, he wouldn't. He didn't really say anything about down payment, but he said he bills biweekly for the duration of construction. Okay. So. And when does that start? Did not till July. Not till, uh, June, June, June one is the. So so we might be in good shape actually with that one. It, there may be two weeks of lay down time before construction yeah, starts. Yeah. So it may be June one okay. the first but he's, sale. He's not looking for some. But haven't we already? Or, haven't we already tran Have we transferred the uh, the two hundred twenty thousand dollars into a fund? So like we we should have an earmark fund of two hundred twenty thousand yeah. dollars, which is. Yeah, right. a, a big Would chunk we, of that, even if there was yeah, a down. Yeah, we do have some. Yeah. I just didn't know if it yeah, was Yeah, it's, it's not a big negotiable in any case. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I asked him because I got concerned that yeah. he'd be looking yeah. for 50% up front or something. Seems like that'd be the, the second one is the reappraisal. And I, have a, I, I need to track down that contract and understand what that is because there probably will be some money due up front for that work. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing is the, the third thing is the timing of the FEMA reimbursements. Right. Talk about that. So it's going to be an interesting period of time, but we're protected with that line of credit. You know, if all else fails, we have access to 1.7 million, way more than what we'll need, I think, in the short term. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So. Thanks. Tony. Questions? Um, you are on top of it. Yes. I'm, maybe this got answered and I missed it. Can we use the line of credit money to help pay for the dam until we can pay it back? Is that? Then we use it for anything we want. Yeah, so. Okay. I just I didn't even think about that and I don't remember. Pay interest on it. But. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So, Tegan, do you want to record anything? Um. We got our town ballots today at the office, so if they're all supposed to be mailed out with these school ballots on Wednesday, um, that autom that happens automatically. But we have some in case people lose them. We've had a couple people, maybe six or eight new registered voters since the um, printing company got our mailing list. So I'll be mailing those out to the people who haven't gotten them yet. Uh, we're supposed to get the school ballots also in the town office this week, uh, so I'll be able to start sending out the career center ballots. Um, Barbara has secured security, light security for election day. Uh, just so folks, including Angela, who have volunteered to come and just, if anyone comes and starts to maybe cause a disturbance, people who are willing to talk to them and maybe walk them outside and help them cool off. You know, we're not talking muscle bouncers, we're just talking people who while the other election officials well, are busy, yes. Yeah. While the other election officials are busy doing the checklist and make, keeping an eye on the tabulator and doing election things, it's nice to have one person sort of set aside to engage with anyone who needs to talk or has questions. Uh, so um, Barbara has gotten that all set up. Uh, we are starting to make plans. We talked to Chris Teller on the phone today about town meeting and when we're going to go in and do setup the day before. And Barbara has made a chart arranging sort of what, you know, the voting area and the lunch area and the town meeting area, you know, it's all, we're all getting there. Uh, well, so. I was shocked. Barbara made a chart. <laughs> <laughs> but she did it digitally. She did, like, Ooh. it was in a computer program. She didn't draw it. <laughs> um, and then we have also been working on dogs. Barbara taught me how to do things in the dog module to get people's licenses. So she and I have been working together to process dog registrations. So that's kind of a, a fun thing to do on the side to distract from all the election things going on. Uh, Barbara, is there anything else you can think of? Yes. Yeah. The town report got printed last oh, week. Oh yeah. There you go. It got bound today, being addressed tomorrow, in the mail on Wednesday. So you can expect your town report in the mail See maybe by the end of the week. Oh, on weekend, Saturday, maybe, maybe. Saturday. It's going to show up on Saturday. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sandra, uh, I don't know if to deliver it. Sooner, so she's a little 
She's happy we're just getting it. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, Tegan and I are meeting tomorrow to look at the election volunteer schedule so we can start scheduling, get the email out and start scheduling election volunteers. Um, and there was something else I was thinking of, but at the moment it escapes me. But it's just so awesome to know the tell reports going in the mail. <laughs> well, congratulations, <laughs> Do an awe over it. Yeah. Tell us how, if you find a mistake, don't tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tell us how wonderful it is. <laughs> the graphic designer we got through uh, the community college has just been excellent. He's been so professional and so punctual and so detail oriented, finding things that you normally don't even have to do as a graphic designer. Uh, he has just been. I, Hiring him was a really good move that Barbara did, and I am very happy that that was a smooth process and not anything we were worried about or grumbling about under our breath this month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Questions? Tegan, did I understand you to say you're, you're doing separate mailings for different ballots, or are we going to get one package with all the ballots? Oh, the yes. usually so, do. you will get a package with the school ballot, the, the Washington Central ballot, and the town ballot. Everyone will get that. That's going out automatically. It doesn't even come through our office. It goes straight from the printer to you all. Uh, the presidential primary, in or if you want to get it ahead of town meeting day, you have to call and request it from the town office. And we will mail it to you or, or pick it up. And the technical center, too. And, and that's, so that's, you have to do that for the presidential, and you have to ask Democrat or Republican uh, for the presidential. And for the career center as well, those are not automatically mailed out. For them to all get mailed out, every town involved in the district has to agree, and all 18 towns in the career center district have not agreed to pay the postage to mail it to everyone. So we don't have them yet. I was told we would have them today or tomorrow. Um, once I have those, if someone requests presidential and career center, I will certainly send them in the same envelope. But we've been sending out presidential as requests have been coming in just to make sure that everyone's getting their ballots. As soon as and when, when can people start voting? Wait, are, are people are going to vote in yeah, two we, weeks. We've already got a box full of How ballots. How vote before you give them ballots? Because we've had the presidential ballots for over two weeks and we posted to yeah. Front Porch Forum. Oh, if you want a presidential ballot, you need to request it. People started requesting them three weeks ago. Uh -huh. So we've already gotten lots of votes already. Mm -hmm. Barbara was the first person to vote. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Jamie, how much money you got these days? <laughs> <laughs> um, not a lot more than I had on Friday, um, which I think, wasn't it just last Friday? That we yes, were? it was. Um, yeah, I mean, pledges kept trickling in over the weekend, um, but I had intended for the big push. Yeah, for Friday, I switched gears a little bit this weekend and started um, sort of targeted conversations with potential large donors um, and have a couple of um, just a lot of ideas and some promising leads, um, which hopefully uh, I should know more in a week. Um, Great job, Jay. I don't think a lot else has happened over the weekend, um, but I did talk to Larry again. I let Larry and Michael know that the bond is moving forward. Um, Larry is, you know, as of now, holding it in his schedule and starting to work things around and assuming we're going ahead this year, um, but knows that there's, you know, still a funding gap that we're working. On that topic, Kari, have you started since Friday? <laughs> Sorry, this is a dumb question. Have we Researching been? tax assessment districts? Yes, no, I, not. of course you have. Um, uh, as I was I, asking it, I was, <laughs> oh yeah, there was a weekend in between. Okay. Some of the potential larger donors that I've been speaking to don't love the idea of a tax assessment district right. um, because they could see it in the long run, which I agree with, as down the road causing challenges of, you know, if there's limited spots in the swim program 10 years from now, do, is there pressure for people in the district to get priority over people not in the district, or other mm -hmm. potential future use conflict for the pond. Um, and so I'm feeling some 
energy to find ways to come up with money without going that route. This is um, good. like a good motivating factor. So Kari, if you could please find some more information. <laughs> I am looking to expedite the tax assessment district conversation. Um, but definitely interested in learning more about that process, but hopeful to not. That's sort of like our fallback, right. last worst case scenario plan. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it would be, I don't know, or an HOA. I was talking to someone who lives on Peachum Pond, and every year they yeah. have to pay for the lady who manually inspects every boat that goes in, and I don't know, just some of the yearly costs, the maintenance, the insurance, the extra insurance we're going to have to cover for the dam, you know, because it's a, a lifetime we're going to be on the hook <laughs> for it. So it would be nice if there was some sort of means to shift that burden a little bit. And I don't know what it would call it, an HOA or a, yeah, but. But it's Monday. You've got tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of time. OK. Uh, anything else on Bruce Pond? No. Uh, Jordan, you got anything on IT? Uh, no, not really. Okay. You and Anne have anything on uh, the shed? Kind of. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be appropriate to go into executive session and have that conversation, and for sure. Okay. Okay. Um, and we're also um, going to have our three months back in with Kari. Also, so I guess we're going to have two executive sessions. Um, so let's see how to do this. We're going to, um, so we have to have separate votes for each one, and then we have to come out and do it again. Or go into one, come out of it, go into another. Come yeah, out. I, yeah, I don't anticipate taking any action uh, okay. for the first okay. one, so I think it would probably be fair to. See Okay. Make a motion for those, or, and kind of dismiss everybody, and take uh, take notes about when to go out and come back. And then home. we'll just provide the notes to uh, Tegan. You're putting these together for us. Is there something wrong with Rose? She's she and Greg are in South Carolina or someplace. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm doing my best, but I will also look back at old minutes to make sure I'm wording everything correctly. Yeah, and getting no, all the it's it'll be fun. So um, I'll take a motion then to go into executive session under Title One, Section Three Thirteen Eight One uh, um, P, pending or probable civil litigation to which the public body, that's us, is the party. Okay. So we're going into executive session. Get all that. Does someone need to? Yeah, it was in the minutes. It was oh, yes. Somebody yeah. please move that. Uh, so moved. Jordan moved. Second. Oh, we're going to invite Kari to come in with us. Uh, okay. Pardon? Please, please add that we're inviting Kari to come in with us. Um, sorry, did we get a second? Okay. Uh, Jamie seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So we'll take a little break.